each of you that have gathered on this morning to give God his honor and to give God his praise. And for us to do that, he inhabits the praises of the saints. So we want to live in his presence where then he's continued to bless us. Thank you for the blessing outside the door. Thank you for the blessings on the inside. God is faithful. And he will not forget all of the things that he has in store for us. And tomorrow, this morning, we have the awesome opportunity to commune with him through his broken body and his shed blood. And when you think of what God has done for you, for me, whew, there is nothing to match us. Thank you for gathering this morning. And those that have tuned us in by the way of media, whether you're in your car, in your home, wherever you are, I trust that you're making your way because there's strength. There is strength in the house of the Lord. My scripture reading this morning is our communion scripture. And as Apostle Paul said, this one was given him. And what I like about God, he left it on record that we can say what he said and do what he did. It is 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 23. And this is what he said. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death until he come. And whosoever 
shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of his body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That is the reading of the scripture for our enlightenment on this morning. Not only the enlightenment, but us to abide by. Our Father and our God, we come to you, God. Clean hands. Father, we stretch our hands to thee for no other help we know. If you withdraw your help from me, where the shall we go? And I said, God, we have nowhere to go. We have nowhere to turn. But we're reaching up because you say, I'm holding on to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your holding. Thank you, God. Because you're holding us in time of darkness. When we can't see our next step. You say you'll shine a light to our path. We thank you for that. So God, we are walking one step at a time. And as the man said, there was a time when there were two steps. And then he got to a place, he said, there was only one. God said, that's when I was carrying you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for strength. Not of myself, but it's your strength. Don't have much voice, God, but that I have, I give it back to thee. Thank you for our leader this morning that will be showing us the way, breaking the bread, leading us into the path of righteousness. God, we pray for sickness everywhere, destruction everywhere. But God, you know, and you set your time. You told us to be faithful until death. So we're still alive. Thank you, Lord. We pray for the bereavement one this morning. Many are mourning, mourning, mourning. But God, we don't mourn as those that don't have hope. Because we hope in you. And we bless your name today. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. For those struggling, trying to make it. Oh God, we say give them strength. Because you are the strength. So God, as we go into the furthest of the service on this morning, we want to tell you one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But it is so. Amen. And bless the Lord. Our vision, mission and our vision statements. Our mission is to bring the simple truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the entangled. And the covering of sight to the blind. To comfort the hurt and discourage, to restore the abandoned and forsaken into the fellowship by grace, to create awareness of our God-given gifts, and may serve the Lord with our whole hearts, minds, and spirit. Therefore, we are 
preparing to be a people ready to meet Christ at his return. Our vision to stand nonviolently against oppressive powers affecting the natural and spiritual relativity within our homes, churches, and communion to comprehensive, compassionate outreach ministry. Thank God for your participation. focus together this morning on amen the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as because of what he has done for us it has changed our very existence and life in the church and for everything that we face today if it had not been for the blood we wouldn't be here today if it had not been for the blood we wouldn't even have the strength that we have right now if we if it had not been for the blood we would not have the regenerating power that exists from that sacrificial moment on calvary so i would that you would prepare yourself and prepare your hearts for communion today as we commune together as a family rest on your feet in this place and first let us pray father in jesus name we thank you that the declaration is that all are welcome to the lord's table oh god i thank you this morning that we are welcome god we don't have to come with any shame we don't have to come as if we're not invited we don't have to come as if nobody wants us there you decided that you died for us all therefore that all are welcome to the Lord's table. But God, when we get here, we need to be honest and confess any faults that we have, confess any sins that we've done. And God, we come to you, God, with an open heart and share that, Father, we repent of anything that we've done that might be out of your will. Anything, God, that we might have not done and, and know it, anything that we've done and we already know that it's wrong. How about, God, the things that we didn't know it's wrong? Father, help us in the name of Jesus to remain not only at the table, during communion but even before the meal is done we thank you right now for the welcoming and God I also pray that you would change our hearts that when others come to the table we'll be glad to pull the seat back for somebody else because God we don't deserve to be here therefore we ought to be open for somebody else to come Lord help us in this church to be a witness of who you are in community that we might continue to make impact in Jesus name thank you Lord and amen all are welcome to the Lord's table the blood all right do as the young people turn and face amen you're right start coming from the rear follow the young people
that back one more time. Come on, come on, come on. Put that community to the side for a minute and lift your voice and share with somebody and say, it reaches. Come on, open your mouth in this room and share that it flows. to what it does. It changes your very existence in its moment. So I dare somebody in the room that needs the blood to come and cover, amen, a pain that you have. Come and cover an emotional struggle that you're dealing with in your life to come and cover something you can't change yourself. I dare you to sing about, uh-huh, it'll never lose. Open your mouth and hear and share. Dare somebody to open up your mouth and help me sing this song and say the blood, it'll never lose its power. Yes, come on and say it. I dare somebody in the room to grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, I need the blood. I need it, I need it in my heart. I need it in my family. I need it on my job. The blood. Somebody in the room, open up your mouth and share that you need it. If you need the blood, open up your mouth, open up your heart, and sing the song. The blood of Jesus. Yes, God. The blood of Jesus. Anybody here got sickness in your body? I dare you, lift your hands and say, The blood of Jesus, the best pain regulator. Oh my goodness, the blood of Jesus, the best pain regulator. Anybody know that the blood will ease the pain? Anybody know that the blood will take the pain away? Anybody know what the blood will do? I tell you in this place today to say the blood, to say that the blood. I shared on yesterday I, I was with somebody Smith that came and while I was talking to the gentleman I asked him can you tell me why he said why I said yes because when you take a BC or Tylenol aspirin it's because you got a headache if your stomach is upset, you take Prilosec or pepto -Bismol. But why do you keep going back to that drug? He said, I don't know what can fix it. But we just got through describing an antidote. That what the blood can do. It's better than any medication that can be prescribed. 
So if you're in this room today, I dare you to take us back one more time and lift your voice and shout the blood. It'll never lose its power. It has reviving power, restoring power. say you got to take your medicine. <laughs> Never lose. Never lose this We're going to do that today together as a family. This pill comes in the capsule. The capsule that's in your hand right now. It comes first with a cracker because the Lord needs to coach your stomach. So when you take this medicine, it won't make you sick. So make sure that you've got your capsule in your hand. Peel that first layer back and get your cracker. Take that cracker and eat it all. So you stuff it to be good. I know I got a, a couple of folk that's still at home. So eat your whole cracker. And pour grape juice. <laughs> and not no whole cup of Morgan Davis in it. Get your little teaspoon here. The body is broken and symbolizes Jesus' body that took the stripes for us. But here we have the blood. You peel that second layer back and that's, that's where you access it. Drink ye all of it. And you just took your medicine. Open up your mouth and say, thank God that I've just medicated what could not be fixed. Amen. I just medicated what they could not prescribe medication for. I just took the antidote because the blood will never lose its power. Amen. If you believe that there's power in the blood of Jesus, I dare you to put your hands together and thank God for the blood of Jesus. I, I said thank God for the blood of Jesus. I'm going to say it one more time. I thought I was in the Christian church where if it had not been for his blood, we wouldn't be saved today. So take just a few seconds. Clap your hands, oh ye people. Open up your mouth and give God praise for the blood of Jesus. I, I, I thought, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Y'all done messed around and got quiet. I don't need a formal service where we're going to be silent in the sanctuary. I need a, a, a few participants in the place that realizes that if it had not been for the blood of Jesus, I, I'd be cuckoo for cocoa. I'd be crazy as all get out. If it had not been, y'all going to make me go too fast, too early. I need a couple of folk in the house to just think, just take a moment to stop. Stop looking at your phone. Stop worrying about who called. Stop worrying about who's talking. And start thanking God for the blood. Oh, this, let me say it this way. When the champion, see, when Kyrie Nim won the championship, they came back to a crowd that were celebrating because of the parade of the Dallas Mavericks coming home and bringing home the chip. I need somebody to understand that the blood of Jesus is the best champion you ever had. And so since it's time for the parade, I dare some of y'all to rest on your feet and celebrate the blood of Jesus and thank God for the blood. I said thank God for the blood. Yeah. I said thank God for the blood. Y'all done got quiet. I, I said thank God for the blood. That if it had not been for the blood of Jesus. Uh,
your mighty God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we bless your name. Hallelujah. God, we bless you. My goodness, I'm excited on this morning. Hallelujah. My goodness.
sets well with you in your hearts. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 13. <clears throat> Good to see everyone that's in the house today. See my cousins here from Chicago. God bless you. Amen. Brother Hakeem. Amen. Y'all didn't know he was in the house, did you? He's in the house. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 13. If you have it, you can say Amen. The Bible says um, in the King James Version today, Mother Lee, uh, and he was teaching in one of the churches. Um, record is that this is Jesus' home church when he began to make the announcement that we currently have our uh, mission statement. When he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, it was at this church. And he was, and Jesus was in his home church on the Sabbath and uh, he was teaching. 
And behold, there was a woman there which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. <laughs> and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Wow. <laughs> what a church. <laughs> Let me repeat that verse one more time. And when Jesus saw her, he called to her. He called her to him and said to her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Watch the text. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. How about you? <laughs> Watch the text. And the pastor of the church <laughs> answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then Jesus <laughs> answered him and said, You hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey. I'm going to get rated G version today. Um, you know, y'all want to say that word. I know it was water in your mouth, wasn't it? Let me start the verse over again. You hypocrite, do not each of you uh, on the Sabbath loose his ox. Mother Pearl, you show enough tickled. Uh, 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 or his donkey from the stall and lay, lead him away to watering. And ought not this woman, look at this, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond, on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for the, all the glorious things that were done by him. If you take a look back at what happened here, the text says, and Jesus, and when Jesus saw her, he called to her, uh, he called her to him. And he said to her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Look at your neighbor this morning, if you will, and, and repeat after me. Neighbor, <clears throat> the preacher came to talk about be healed, be delivered, and be set free. You looked at the wrong neighbor because there was supposed to be a shout behind that. I dare you to look at somebody else and say, neighbor, I command you to be healed. I command you to be delivered and I command you to be set free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bishop G.E., for the title. Amen. In psychology today, Dr. Steve Taylor wrote uh, an interesting article about why religious people fail to live up to our teachings. I was intrigued by this because the, uh, uh, this text was interrogating the church. And whenever the church is interrogated, I feel some type of way. That someone would say that I am not living up to the teachings of the church makes me ask a whole lot of qualifying questions. And so I called Taylor and, and text him and asked him, how in the world can you say such a thing about God's church? He said, it's because we hide behind our piety and our praxis. Then we, we hide behind the film of being religious people and we practice religious things, but only to limited capacity that we know how to pray on Sunday. We know how to worship during certain worship hours. We know how to gather on Sunday morning. But what happens when it's time for us to take the church outside the walls of the building? Dr. Taylor says that the church has a way of looking real good and religious on Sunday, but we forget to practice on Monday through Sunday. Saturday. Dr. Taylor was arguing that the church has religious teachings and we have set a high bar for human behavior, but 
followers of the church have often struggled to meet the demand. It is almost as if we can get sued for false advertisement. That we can say that we are the people of God, but when it's time for the people of God to perform, we're on break. I wish I had somebody here for, to understand that this indictment is not just on the preacher, but it's on the pew. Because when Dr. Taylor is making this call, he's not just looking at pastors and leaders. He's looking at the whole church. And the church is on the table today because there is a question of whether or not we're living up to the teachings of the scripture mm -hmm. and so then church it's not easy for us to do this because watch this when Jesus set the bar it was a goal that he intended on us to meet continually and D'Angelo I will offer today it is not easy to love my enemy it is not easy to turn the other cheek. I'm from North Memphis. You slap me, I might not, I might not break, I might not turn the other cheek. I might pull my knife out. And see, while you're sitting there looking real pious, you struggle too. Because when it's time for you to not return insult for those that insulted you, for not check back the people that's trying to check you. It's something about, amen, how it's difficult to meet the demand that God has put on us. And while it is that I know that you've been in church all your life and you've never cussed nobody, but it's something about how you feel when folk do stuff to you and you ain't done nothing to them. And then we got a hood proverb that's not in scripture, but it definitely lives in our house. And that is that you better not let nobody hit you and you don't hit them back. The proverb is that they hit you first, you end the fight. And that's the thing that we grew up on while coming to church on Sunday morning and saying when they hit you, turn the other cheek. We have conflict. Because, you know, church, I know that we today live the scripture. But this church in the hood lives the proverb that if somebody hits you in the eye, you better not come home and tell mama they hit me <laughs> without mama walking you back down there and your arm up there, you understand? And you're getting dragged for mama to, tell, to point out the person that did it and then tell you handle that business. And while it is that I know, Mother Lee, amen, that we are trying our best to live up to what Jesus said, amen, I got a church that stands on business. That when it comes down to it, that we're not going to fight you automatically. But if you start something, it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. touch your neighbor and say he really preaching to us today amen hey, if you start something it's going to be something. and here it is church when it comes down to it this is part of the struggle of being who we are because I've learned that no matter how Christian a person may appear everybody has a limit and sometimes there are people that specializes in tap dancing on your limit. And while you're trying to say, leave me alone, don't play for me, don't play with me, you better pray for me. But folk just keep on doing stuff. They keep on playing with me as if I'm not that one. But I'm the one, amen, that will make you go and ask the Lord, why did the preacher do me like that? I'm not that one, amen, that will sit back and just let you keep doing stuff. Me and you both going to be standing for the Lord with our hands up in repentance. Because you keep messing with me, Derek, you're going to make me repent on you. Mm -hmm. And so then, church, whew, let me, let me get back to this. Let me get back to this. So, so we have crisis because the scripture says that Jesus offered us some assistance because oftentimes we are good at obeying the hood proverb. We are great at obeying, watch this, the law, but we struggle with doing God's law. So they, they interrogated Jesus on one occasion in Matthew 22 and 34. They said to them, they said, Jesus, we need to know, amen, how do we obey all the laws and stay in good context with God? And hearing that, the Bible says, verse 34 of chapter 22, he said, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees together, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him, watch this, with a question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? 
Jesus replied, love the God, love the God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so then, herein lies the place where Dr. Taylor doubles down on the church. Because Dr. Taylor says, since the beginning, the church uh, uh, has a responsibility to, to love God holistically and love his people as ourselves. And so then this challenge is evident, especially in communities, watch this, where choice and circumstance are often confused, creating even greater conflict. Can I go deeper? It's like when a person is placed on a narcotic for pain resulting from injuries of a car accident. And then that same method is used to treat emotional pain because that person now has survivor's remorse. And we then look at them and say to them that you're a junkie hung up on those pills, but not understanding that there was a circumstance leading up to how that introduced this methodology of easing pain. And isn't it amazing how it is that we can sit there and in judgment and look put our nose down on folk because of what they use to treat pain but they didn't know that Jesus eases pain and so then, church, it takes us to understand that we got to learn that we got a lot of people that come to church that while it is every Sunday, they're coming to hear about a Jesus, but they're still using cocaine and Mary Jane. I'm sorry, marijuana. I'm going to leave this. Just, just, and so, watch this. We, we would say that, watch this now. Those folk did that because they have made a choice. Hmm. They made a choice. But what happened to the child that had THC in their system? Because of the parental choices that happened before the child was born. And so it's in their system and their chemistries are off and we're still trying to treat them to figure out how to help them. But in the midst of us being the kind of church that we've been, instead of us treating them with love and kindness, we treat them with judgment because we don't know how to handle their circumstance. Have you ever been a victim? Of folk not knowing how to handle your circumstance. <laughs> that, that, that you don't want to tell them too much. Because they, they can't handle the whole truth. And, and so since you can't handle my real truth. I can only tell you so much. Because you'll mess around and start judging instead of loving. Instead of you extending kindness and mercy. You want to hurry up and get the law out and whoop me. This is all because... We have people that are very critical. How about the woman that you see coming up in church and all of a sudden she's pregnant? And you want to judge her and talk about how it is that she's out there having sex before wedlock. And she's out there doing stuff she should not do. But you didn't know she was raped. And while you're talking about what she did, it's actually something that happened to her. But you don't know how to handle it because you don't understand the circumstances behind the situation. I came to argue this morning that we got a major problem in church because we judge on first hand. Time we look at it, we start critiquing. Time we look at it, we start talking about folk and criticizing folk. But I'm telling you, the church has often mistaken and mismanaged circumstance and choice. Because, listen, if you want to judge something, judge why I did it rather than what I did. And when you judge why I did it, it's because you understand the stuff I had to go through before I did it. And I dare somebody in this room to realize that, listen here, that we need to be careful how we talk about folk. Look at your neighbor and say, get your mouth off them folk. Get your mouth off of people. You don't know, amen, what it is that they're going through, what it is they're dealing with. All you know is she cussed. <laughs> but do you know <laughs> what she did to make her cuss? 
do you know who cussed her? <laughs> so is that her reaction or is that her response? <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, but Derek, I got a problem. Because we got a lot of folk in church that really don't know how to handle a person's circumstance. So preacher, how do we handle it? How do we handle the circumstance? Well, let me ask y'all a question. What is the difference between sympathy and empathy? Oh, it sure is. It sure is. But oh, it ain't got Bible study quiet in this church. Let me teach you. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. We, oh, we're going to go slow. Since y'all since y'all real smart in here today, we're going to go slow. It, boy, it didn't got quiet. All that talking back it didn't stop. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Mm hmm. Yo, uh, I'm sure y'all want to know now. Okay. Both sympathy and empathy have roots in the Greek word pathos, uh -huh. which uh, pathos means suffering and feeling. So sympathy was first. It is often described as compassion and is largely used uh, to convey pity, feelings of sorrow for someone who is experiencing mis misfortune. Dr. Martin Luther King said on one occasion, pity may represent little more than the impersonal concern which prompts the mailing of a check. But true sympathy is the personal concern which demands the giving of one's soul. We are quick to send somebody a card, but will you be present? <laughs> Oh, Jesus, we, 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 we'll, we'll give you something to make you get away from us. But as Job, when he had his struggle, the Bible says his friends sat with him for a minute. I struggle with this kind of church, Mother Haynes, that, that'll give me an offering but won't give me a conversation. <laughs> That's just sympathy. Let me, let me take it a, a step further and talk about empathy. Empathy enters the English language about uh, 300 centuries or 300 years later. And, and it says, watch this, uh, unlike sympathy, psychologists begin using empathy as a translation for the concept that a person could project their own feelings onto a viewed object. So, so watch this now. Unlike sympathy, empathy has to come to, uh, to, to be used in a broader way than it was when it was first introduced. So, so the term is now most often used to refer, refer to the capacity or ability to imagine oneself in the situation of the other. Experiencing their emotions, understanding their ideas, and, and hearing their opinions without judging. And so then, I then argue that in this church today, we need some more teaching on empathy. We need more teaching on sympathy. Because, Derek, it's one thing for us to see what's happening in community. It's another for us to speak to it. Mm -hmm. See, see, when, when we, I know we want to hurry up and get to woman thou art loosed, but we got to look at the text and realize that before he loosed her, he saw her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm telling you now, we have a real, we want to hurry up and get to the good part, but the teaching in the text requires us to understand that we have mismanaged empathy. We have mismanaged understanding, amen, that, that when it comes down to being poor, do you know what it's like? I know you know how to critique it, but what's it like? And it takes somebody that's been poor that can give you commentary to, to tell you, don't you look at folks and say they're poor because of bad choices. In some instances, they're poor because of where they were born. Mm -hmm. And so then, church, I want to share that I believe that we in the spirit field church need a good a good dosage of empathy. Because sympathy and empathy or empathy and compassion are, watch this, foundational characteristics in the Bible. And they are central to Christian living. 
See, see, the Bible describes empathy as the ability to, to feel another person's thoughts. To, for you to be able to embrace somebody else's attitude. So, so when somebody struggles with the death of a loved one, instead of you telling them be strong, you tell them what can I do for you? I need to teach y'all how to be with folks. Yeah, yeah. what can I do for you? Doesn't mean, amen, you have the ability to restore life. What it does mean, you have the capacity to sit with them, serve them, help them. God Almighty. Compassion is the ability to understand and appreciate another person's feelings while demonstrating care. And the Bible shows us both compassion and empathy. Watch this in several ways. Because in Psalms 86 and 15, the Bible says, but you, O Lord, are God full of compassion and gracious long-suffering, and an abundant mercy and truth. Uh, Galatians picks it up and says, God the Father is the God of compassion. He is the Father of compassion, and he is the God of all comfort. Uh, And so then, in order for God to be, to occupy this space, God had to do some stuff for some folk for him to get that description. Uh, And so I wonder, how about our church? Uh, Would we be the people that folk would describe us as folk that come along Alongside people when they're dealing with tragedy and disgust. Uh, will we be the folk that people will describe us as folks that comfort people when they had trouble and trial? Uh, but the Bible de- declares that the God we serve is the one that has that on his logo. Uh, his mission statement is he's gracious and long suffering. Uh, his mission statement is he's all compassionate. Uh, the God we serve is a God of all comfort. Uh, and so then, church, will you be the one that God can count on? to comfort somebody when they got a struggle to be with somebody when they got a death in the family to help somebody when they're going through something to sit with somebody with an addiction well that was God but then Jesus shows us compassion and empathy because here in in Luke 13 He's healing a woman that's been over in church. <laughs> she's been over, but she's still in church. <laughs> I, I want y'all to let that sit in in the text of how, how long she's been getting stared at. Because back then, to have a sickness is due to a sinful behavior. That you got to be sinful to be bent over. (laughs) And they don't know what to do with this lady. That's sinful, but still in church. God, if I had time, I would ask the question, how many of you have ever done some stuff that has some residual effect on you, but you keep coming to church? (laughs) God, I I came to share, amen, that we have to be careful how we look at folk. Because watch this, when Jesus looked at her, he saw something different. He didn't see her bent over. He saw her potential. This is what empathy does. See, See, the twins of sympathy and empathy are originated in God the Father and are expressed in the human nature and behavior of Jesus. And therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we today can be empathic and compassionate towards our neighbors. Yes, we can. We can be the best expression of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Lesson number six of evidence, of of those of us having evidence of the Holy Spirit, here's the deal. If you are filled with the Spirit, you can be empathic. Yes, you can. You you can show empathy if you're filled with the Spirit. Let me read to you the principle that's on the screen. To be empathic is to soften the boundaries of the ego self and transcend separateness so that we can sense the essential oneness of all human beings and work together to alleviate uh, uh, others' suffering and make the world a more harmonious place. I've, I've preached two sermons already. What we have to understand is, is that, watch this, to, to express empathy is to help us to share in humanity. And to express empathy is to help us to have harmony in community. Can I sneak up on this text? 
and share that the Bible says that Christ had some insightful intentions for our inward infections. Uh, according to Luke, this woman was short in statue because of her condition. But she met Jesus one day and the final act of his recorded ministry at his home church. And now her shortness, Mother Lee, was due to not an inherited stature, whereas she was short, amen, and she was uh, 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 less than four feet. But she was short because she had a crippling disease, uh, amen. And the consensus of the doctors of the time said that her uh, affliction is called spondylosis deform, deformans, uh, causing the bones of her spine to fuse into a rigid mass. Uh, so then she has a bone condition mm -hmm. uh, because she ran into the devil one day. And, and there, there's no suggestion that the woman was demon possessed at the time uh, because the, uh, there was no casting out of the devil at the time when she met Jesus. But the Bible did say that she came under attack and the devil left her broken, bound, and crippled for eight years. This woman was crippled. This woman was bowed. This woman was weak. And she was humbled by an attack from the devil. She was unable to get herself back up. But the poor woman had to come all bent over. And in one moment, her life changed forever. Because this woman met Jesus and he had some insightful intentions. Because he looked at her inward infections and said to her, I I see where you are. Can I pause there and share that we have a God that does not allow us to continue to walk broken and be crippled all the time. When he sees us where we are, he then has intentionality to cry and require a meeting. God, I wish I had a church that understands that you got a Jesus that can see you having a residual effect from a bad situation. And when he sees you, he calls for a meeting. Can I get a couple of y'all that's been there that ever had a meeting with Jesus and when he saw you where you were he didn't leave you in a crippled state but he saw you and then he spoke to you. Can I get sneak up on you uppity folk in the church that can see a folk cripple and instead of you speaking you stare but I came to share something in this place that's the opposite of what Jesus did. Empathy is when you see something you say something he didn't just see her where she was. He spoke to what she had. I'm scared of folk in the church that'll sit there and see you and talk about you, but won't talk to you. I'll come sit on your row in just a minute. I'm scared of folk that are empathic towards white people, but not empathic towards their own people. <laughs> Oh, you'll go out there for March of Dimes, but you won't pay tithe. <laughs> you'll give all kinds of money, amen, to uh, those other programs because you quote unquote say, I can see where the money going. But you do understand that you're paying their salaries too. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. We got a whole lot of empathy for folks outside. But what about the folk on the inside? We got empathy for folk in community, but we don't have empathy for people in the church. Let me let me slow down. So, so, so. <laughs> Is there anybody in this church that can be honest? That before you got straightened out, because you used to be bent over too. You used to be crippled too. And here it is. You used to be crippled, but you're looking at everybody else with your nose down. And oftentimes, Brooke Carter, it is Christ that can see your inward diseases. <laughs> because the woman had a crippling disease, but couldn't nobody tell you where her problem was. The doctors were able to describe based upon her activity. But nobody knew her condition. But Jesus spoke to what you couldn't see. And while it is that we have a quiet church today, it's because I know I pastor some folk with some inward infections. 
You might not want to tell the truth today, but I know you are ex something. I know, I know, I know you can talk about the girl that had a baby outside of wedlock, but uh, how about you? I know you can talk about the man, amen, that smoked everything that he could find, but how about you? You can talk about what they did, but can you testify about what you did? It's amazing how testimony service gets quiet after folks start talking about their yesterday life. Things I used to do, I don't do anymore. <laughs> ah, God. But here it is, church. I wonder how many of us have inward infections that need touched by Jesus. But we can't confess them because of the kind of church that we've been hanging with. Well, 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 that's the first part. That we had a Christ that was intentional about speaking to, amen, these inward, uh, these inward infections, right? But then secondly, as we progress the text, because I got to hear up and move, uh, there, there was a, an intervention that was met with indignation. That when you read the Bible uh, in verse number 14, we meet the pastor. The pastor is the ruler of the synagogue, but he has no heart and no pity towards the poor. He, he had more love for the law than he did love for his neighbor. <laughs> and see, this is where, church, it really gets good to me. Because in order for us to really understand the preacher's heart, we got to look at this word in the text called indignation. There's a reason why I chose the King James Version because of that word right there. Indignation means, watch this, it is a complex and a discreet emotion that is triggered by social emotions and social environments. That's layer number one. Secondly, it is feelings of anger and disgust because, watch this, you can't handle what you see. <laughs> I'm telling you the problem we have in church is not because God didn't put us in position to help folk. It's when the folk come and need help how we look at them. Come here, come here, come here. How did you look at the drunk that came in? Did you see the opportunity to preach the gospel? Or did you see somebody that gets on your nerves? How do you look at Junebug in your own family? That every time that they come and they need help, the first thing you say is, I'm sick of you. But you just got to be talking about a God that is long-suffering. But for us, our suffering has an expiration moment. I came to preach in this house because in order for us to express what empathy is, we got to be careful how we respond to the opportunities that God put in place. Uh, we have the nerve to have indignation uh, when somebody comes that need to be helped. Mm -hmm. Ease into it, preacher. Ease, e ease into it. Uh, to have indignation is to be mad. <laughs> you mad at the woman that made a bad decision. She's already feeling bad. And then when she comes, you got mad. They came to you for help. And instead of you helping, you did more hurting. The church is the place that specializes in injuring those that are already hurt. Because when people come looking for a savior, we run into folks that are so sanctified that they can't save nobody else. That we done messed around and put a limit or a cap on who can get in the door. Based upon how we describe our Jesus will allow people in. But I need you to be careful because if you got in, <laughs> you need to be careful how you stop somebody else from getting in. <laughs> if you can take a look at your past <laughs> and take a moment to realize <laughs> that if it had not been for the Lord <laughs> that was on your side. <laughs> oh. I just want to see if y'all was awake. Uh, indignation. Indignation, church, is, is, is the lacking, watch this, of the indwelling. <laughs> that when you are expressing indignation, you're, you're telling God you can't feel me <laughs> because I have a ceiling on my spirit. <laughs> uh, it's because you cannot accept or accommodate uh, the, the fullness of God's truth. <laughs> I, I've learned, Lord have mercy, Mother Lee, <laughs> I've learned how to be like Christ, <laughs> to rebuke those hypocrites <laughs> that 
tell folk who they can and cannot be. I know that, amen, I'm not in good company, but I got to tell the truth. I've been around folk that say they know such thing as jailhouse and hospital bed religions. But I beg the differ, boss, because I saw a thief on the cross. I saw somebody that didn't go through the tenets of the church. I saw somebody that didn't go through new members class. I saw somebody that didn't read a scripture at all. All he said is, Lord, when you get to paradise, remember me. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Oh, that interrupts the doctrine of the church because this man didn't go through new members class. This man didn't get baptized. This man didn't do nothing but confess, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, you're welcome. Can I get a couple of y'all in the place that knows that Jesus will welcome you? Because oftentimes it is indignation uh -huh, that blocks the intervention of God. Now the spice in the text was when this man got mad about, first of all, a daughter of Abraham. Now that's the part that made me shout. Because she had her business in order. She deserved to be healed. Because she was in the lineage of the people that Christ was sent to. But the pastor said, even though she's in the lineage, she don't deserve to get help. Because she's done something evidently that left her crippled. Jesus, being smart as he is, said to the pastor, I get it that you feel she don't deserve it. But favor ain't fair. Can you look at somebody on your road and tell them, I know I don't deserve what God's going to give me. But thanks be to God that favor ain't fair. It ain't about fairness. It ain't about whether or not I qualify according to your lens. But it's because I got a God that I serve uh, that will look beyond my faults uh, and supply every need that I have. Uh, and so then I got a God uh, that will intervene in the midst of me being crippled. Uh, that will intervene in the midst of me being bent over. Uh, that will intervene in the midst of me having a struggle. Uh, but the Bible progresses, Mother Lee, uh, that because the woman heard Jesus uh, and she still didn't move. Uh, can I preach like I feel it. Uh, there's a lot of you that heard the words uh, to be healed and be delivered uh, and be set free. Uh, but the action did not improve uh, until the Lord laid his hands uh, on the woman. Uh, let me back up and show it to you again. Uh, the Bible says that he spoke the word. Uh, woman thou art loosed uh, from thine infirmity. Uh, but the woman still didn't move. Uh, and then he went and laid hands on her. Uh, and then immediately she got healed uh, can I park there and preach for a second uh, there are some of you in the place uh, that God came to heal uh, and the word being spoken uh, it's just one aspect of it uh, but the second part of it is uh, you got to come and let the preacher uh, lay his hands on you uh, and the moment he does uh, and the moment she does uh, God then will straighten up uh, what is crooked uh, he will fix uh, what is broken uh, but all you got to do uh, is hear the words uh, and then take action uh, push your neighbor this morning uh, and say neighbor uh, in order for the intervention of God uh, to be effective in your life uh, you got to hear the words uh, and then you got to take action uh, can I back it up with scripture uh, faith without works uh, is dead uh, lift your voice in the place uh, and say, God, help me to hear. Uh, download the interventions uh, so I can take actions. Uh, part of the problem we're having uh, with our production today uh, is because we have not heard God uh, and we're just out there doing stuff. Uh, you might want to stop uh, and say, God, process uh, the entire download uh, so I can take actions uh, with the right intentions. Uh, 
because God came to intervene. God came to change. God came to lift up the bow down head. The preacher in the text. The ruler in the synagogue looked down on the woman. The ruler in the synagogue was looking at her downwardly because she was bent over. But she met a Jesus that lifted her up. And I came to preach to a couple of y'all that knows that Jesus will lift up those that others have looked down on. Help me close in the place. If anybody ever looked down on you because of a circumstance, because of a situation, let me introduce you to Jesus because he will lift up those folk that others are looking down on. Have you ever in the building done something that you're not proud of? Have you ever in the building did something that you're ashamed of but instead of Christ kicking you out of church putting you off the praise team revoking your preacher's license he decided to lift you up while everybody else is looking down because I told y'all in the beginning before I took this plane to the next level that favor ain't fair and I came to tell somebody that Jesus is in the business of lifting up bowed down heads if you're in the building I dare you here lift up your heads O ye gates and be ye lifted up I dare you to do it pick your head up because what you did does not define who you are I feel like preaching here push your neighbor and say neighbor what you did does not define who you are what you smoked does not define your destiny the sins that you committed do not define who you are in God because if any man uh be in Christ he is a new creation old thing are passed away and behold all things have become new can I close like a fillet the woman in the text taught me something preachers look at the text again you got a woman that's bent over you got a woman that's crippled one writer says she was so low to the ground it looked like she was looking for a grave she was so low to the ground that it looked like her outlook towards life was only downward but that ain't what I see in the text because one thing about this woman is the fact that in spite of what happened in spite of the sour lemons that she was dealt she kept on coming back to the church can I preach like I feel it she came every Sabbath day she was in the church can I preach like I want to I dare some of y'all to learn how to celebrate the right stuff this woman is crippled but she kept coming to church if she had to crawl she made it to the building if they talked about her she came anyway if they laughed at her condition she kept on coming to Christ and this is where the shout is in the text is that she didn't look downwards but her spiritual eye was looking upwards she saw the potential when Jesus came to church good evening grace may the Lord bless you real good but on my way to heaven I came to tell somebody look up and live you got a savior coming for a meeting and when you get there what will you do yes I feel it now Trevor when the meeting happens will you look up and see the Savior shrug your neighbor in this house and say pick your head up don't crawl don't quit don't fight it keep on going 
Don't quit. Don't run from it. Run to it. Don't you stop because of the weight. The woman was bent over. And I can imagine after the years of being bent over, the weight and the pressure was on her back, but she kept going. God told me to tell you, I see the weight on your back. God told me to tell you, I see the heaviness on your family. I see the burdens that you carry. And I came to help you come out of the depression. I see what divorce did to you. I see what he did and how he left you. I see the struggle because nobody understands where you are. But God told me to help some of the theology in the pew because the woman kept coming to church for 18 years lift your voice and shout don't quit I said tell your neighbor don't quit I said tell your neighbor you're too close don't give up don't quit I know that it's tough but don't throw in the towel don't stop until you get it don't quit because God is about to do a wonder for you don't quit you push the wrong neighbor touch a neighbor on the other side say neighbor don't quit Don't quit, don't quit. It's easy to stop where you are. It's better if you see it through to the end. Don't quit, I know that it's hard. I know that it's heavy, but don't quit. Encourage your pew partner and say, neighbor, don't quit don't quit you got too much on the table that you're gonna lose if you quit and the bible says check the record let us not be weary in oh god in our well-doing for in due seasons you shall reap if you faint not, lift your voice and shout, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Is there anybody here? Let's go, Trevor. Is there anybody here? Yes. Is there anybody in this place that saw in the text that the woman, after the encounter with Jesus Christ, was healed immediately? Can I argue one more thing? That the woman did not have an instantaneous moment because she had 18 years of lead time where she waited and kept coming but here's the theology and I'll go with this rest on your feet in this building I feel breakthrough in the place God told me to tell you that the woman had 18 years of lead time and here's the theology the woman says for those in grace God may not heal you immediately but he will do it eventually lift your hands and shout it will take place 
for me if not immediately it will be eventually but God will make change over my life and I can shout look where the Lord has brought me from he brought me from a mighty long way and if you're here and God did it for you lift those hands and give him a shout whether he did it immediately or eventually shout one good time shout like God did it shout like he made a way shout like you got healed shout that God did it shout I said shout I, I said shout I said shout take that hand grab a neighbor by the hand and repeat after me God knows tell your neighbor God knows your inward infirmity and God is saying be healed be delivered and be set free let that hand go and shout it's all the winds it's all the winds it's all the winds I ain't got it no more I ain't thirsty no more I'm healed I'm delivered I'm set free shout yes shout yes 